I'd like to do in uh, my short presentation is uh, share uh, some of the methods that, that work well for me. I've been involved in, in a lot of rangeland monitoring for quite a number of years, and uh, Tanya did provide a link uh, to uh, uh, the method that I'm going to be reviewing, and I want to primarily uh, share my thoughts with you in terms of, of site selection and actually uh, setting up these these photo points. And, and I think this cover slide is probably a really good place to begin. Uh, one of the comments that we make uh, in the text for which Tanya gave you a link is uh, making sure that you are uh, anywhere from a quarter to a half a mile away from the nearest water location. Uh, other, other primary concerns would be to uh, uh, try to select sites uh, that are the dominant or primary range sites on your property. Uh, in that process, you have to be a little bit careful, and this is a prime example right here. This fence line uh, was set up just up slope of a dead furrow, and this large flat area was actually a large piece of ground that was farmed for many years, and then uh, uh, some attempt to reseed and eventually abandon. Uh, this, this is a La Lomi range site, but because of fast, the past farming activities, you would not want to select sites on this kind of a location. But as it turns out, the two primary uh, kinds of, of uh, range sites or ecological sites on this ranch are actually the Limey Upland, which is right in this area, and then there are still uh, a very, uh, there's a very large percentage of acreage that uh, uh, there would be loamy sites on this ranch which have uh, no farming history. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the equipment uh, that I use. And um, this may look like a surgery kit, but everything in here represents uh, a different component to my monitoring kit that has been extremely useful uh, over the years. And uh, there are instructions in terms of how to put these graduated staffs together. You can uh, the uh, the graduated staff uh, is uh, 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 is PVC, and I uh, use a combination of, of wood dowels and PVC for the graduated staff. The other item in here would be the PVC frame. But uh, let's start off uh, when we when we talk about these PVC. Um, tools. Uh, I'll, I'll share some uh, some comments with you. Uh, before we do that, I want to draw your attention to a couple of other items uh, here, and that is you can use different kinds of tape. They need to be the tapes need to be a hundred feet long. I actually prefer those tapes that have a they're on a reel and they have a handle. Uh, the reason I I prefer these over the uh, the other streamlined tapes is because uh, you can put a, a large spike. This is a 10-inch spike uh, with survey ribbon on it. And at this point, I'd encourage you to put survey ribbon on everything that has a tendency to blend into uh, the landscape. Um, but you can take a, a, a large spike and drive that through uh, into the ground through the handle and hold this tape in place. It's much more difficult to do that over here. Now. A, a potential alternative to the PVC frame for which you have the instructions through the link that Tanya provided, an alternative would be to use these fold, uh, folding wooden rulers uh, that are technically referred to as brick mason rules, but these are six foot long folding rulers, so you can fold them out and bend them at the three point line and have uh, two sides uh, to a square uh, with each of those units. A uh, can of red paint, uh, I use a two-pound sludge for driving, a sledgehammer for driving in wood post or steel post. I use the rubber mallet uh, for uh, uh, tapping uh, the frame together and also separating it. And uh, the clipboard it, uh, is an absolutely essential part uh, of your equipment. Uh, make sure that you uh, paint everything olive drab or some kind of non-reflective paint. That uh, This was previously... Uh, metal and the reflection off of that can really cause problems with the photographs underneath this clipboard, which is legal size 
it's a legal size. You can you can pick these up at places like Staples and other locations. Underneath the clipboard is a tatum. The tatum is about two inches uh, uh, thick. It's deep. Uh, you can store uh, felt pens uh, and your uh, your photo. Uh, identification sheets inside of that keeps them dry and clean. Uh, the other point I would make is that I've used different containers for this uh, equipment uh, over the years, uh, but I really uh, have found that uh, this particular toolbox is extremely effective. This is made by Stanley. It's a Fat Max toolbox. Uh, relatively inexpensive. It has a rubber gasket all the way around it. I love this thing because you can get all of this stuff inside this thing. It's watertight and dustproof. You can strap it onto a four-wheeler. You can put it in the back of a, of a pickup. It always stays dry and clean in there. Um, these PVC units are laying on top of a very inexpensive uh, uh, fleece uh, uh, comforter and uh, they work great. You can roll everything up inside that, put a couple of bungee straps uh, around the, 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 the final bundle, and uh, they can, uh, that way you can haul them with any kind of vehicle and, and minimize the scratching on the surface of the PVC. And then we'll also be talking about some kind of a visual marker. This is just an old T-bar fence post, but at this point, let's go ahead and take a look uh, at the uh, PVC uh, graduated staff. And the instructions that you have access to talk about uh, using the wooden dowel. Uh, you just drive that wooden dowel in, the one that has a point on it, and then what we'll do is go through a quick series here. Slide the bottom portion of the graduated staff over the top. Uh, uh, make sure that the six, six inch increments are on the bottom and that the uh, one foot increment on the bottom half is on top. Then slide another piece of dowel in if needed. Uh, there will certainly be uh, situations where all you really need is the first three feet. You may never need the top three feet uh, at the uh, plot area that you're going to photograph, but I recommend you use the full six feet uh, when you're doing your landscape photo. So that's step three. Step four is simply uh, slide that next uh, uh, PVC section uh, over the top. Now, if we take a look at the, the uh, PVC frame, uh, people have used a lot of different kinds of frames over the years, uh, but this one has really worked well for me, and it's a great way to actually set up your photo points initially, and, and uh, I'll show you that uh, if you drive wooden stakes into the corners, that it makes the plot so easy to find. And there's only going to be one, one, photo, one photo plot uh, to work with in this method that we're asking you to consider. And uh, notice that the 90 degree angles are actually glued on to the two opposite sides. And so uh, lay it down on the ground, slide those pieces uh, together, and uh, after the pieces uh, are uh, snug together by hand, you're going to get enough grit from uh, rangeland use that you'll need to take the rubber mallet and just gently tap the corners to make sure that it's that all of the corners uh, are firmly set. And after you have a, after you have set up your uh, your uh, photo plot location, use that rubber mallet one more time and gently tap the sides away. Uh, onto which the 90-degree uh, angles were glued. Uh, that's top and bottom. Take that mallet and just tap those away, and you'll convert it into a four-piece unit that can be easily rolled up again into the fleece. If we talk about stakes, that's going to depend a little bit on the kind of ground uh, that you have. And uh, I have uh, I've done most of my long-term monitoring with the metal stakes. It's certainly important to get some kind of a bend in the top, uh, and uh, uh, these go into virtually any kind of, uh, you can get these into the ground on almost any kind of range site. Uh, on sandy or loamy, sandy loam sites, wooden stakes that can be driven into the ground fairly easily, but remember that if you are setting these uh, photo points up uh, under drought conditions that extremely dry soil can be very difficult, uh, to drive wooden stakes into, 
And in this particular location, this is a, a limey upland, and uh, these dark green patches are, are uh, threadleaf sedge or an, uh, also called black root. Um, that root mass is extremely dense and it's extremely hard to drive wooden stakes all the way down to the proper depth uh, where you have an abundance of this species. These roots uh, seem to last forever and uh, goes back to perhaps Dan's question in terms of asking about if you can dig plants up and, and you still see roots that are, that are flexible or pliable, does that, doesn't, shouldn't that, or is that an indication that there may still be some live buds in the plant? Uh, my experience is that, as Julie indicated, that if you, have, uh, if you, if you simply don't have any leaf area um, uh, uh, on those crowns, uh, and classic example is right here. This is all drought-induced plant mortality. It's almost almost all of the dead crowns you see in this photograph are associated with blue gramma. Uh, when you have really dry conditions, it t uh, those roots don't break down very rapidly. It's not until the drought breaks and uh, you begin to have the uh, an increase in soil microbial populations, and eventually the the, the roots uh, 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 decompose. So. Flexible roots would not be a conclusive uh, test. What I look for is what's going on at the soil level upward. But let's take a look at setting up the photo plot now. We're, remember, the whole objective here is you want to get that 100-foot uh, tape stretched out over a representative area. I've already indicated that on this particular ranch that these limey upland sites, which is where we are now, and sandy sites, are the two dominant. It's about a 60-40 uh, percent composition on sites. You can see in, uh, in, the, in this particular slide that I opted to use a, a metal uh, stake. I just drove that in with my two-pound sledgehammer, put a flag at that point. Uh, this metal stake works extremely well for me because the loop on my 100-foot reel tape slides right over that very easily. Uh, uh, and then what I did was I ran that out. I found an area uh, that I felt was very representative of the best of the uh, uh, limey upland uh, on, uh, in this pasture or on this ranch. And then I went up slope and I locked the tape at 50 feet. I locked the slope and uh, uh, when we got up to that point, I want you to be aware of the fact that you uh, need to be careful that, that you don't run this transect over the top of pocket gopher mounds, ant mounds, uh, uh, badger tunnels, whatever, or maybe you have a, a, a rock or, or a very disturbed area. Uh, this tape is locked at 50 feet. The photo plot is going to be located five feet away uh, from, 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 uh, from this point. And so I'm sliding to the left or uh, to the right uh, to make sure uh, that, what, that I get uh, a location. Uh, and I moved over this way so that I had a location where that plot was, was at least uh, 8 to 10 feet away from, from pot and gopher mounds. I put a flag in at 50 feet and uh, unlocked the tape and uh, took it all the way out to, to, uh, uh, to 100 feet. When I got to the 100-foot point, uh, I locked uh, my tape uh, and uh, uh, put that spike uh, into the handle to hold it in place, uh, put a flag down at the 100-foot point, and uh, set my base dowel uh, for that uh, graduated staff. So now we have, at this point, we have the 100-foot tape. We know that everything is, uh, is good uh, for us uh, uh, over the, uh, the whole uh, uh, area that's going to be photographed. We're, uh, at this point, this is 55 feet, and this is 58 feet at this point. And so I put a flag in at, beat, at each of those locations. And uh, I want to set... I actually want to set this frame up and get it in place before I take the landscape photograph. And this, this is the landscape photograph. I'm going to encourage everyone to drive stakes into the corners 
uh, of the plot. And the reason is because this will make it much faster. Uh, if you don't have uh, tall plants, if you're not in the on sandy or sand sites in good to excellent condition with a lot of warm season tall grasses uh, in the central Great Plains uh, or, or other, other areas with tall grasses of any species, you should be able uh, to just walk right up to this location. And if you have uh, these stakes in the corners, you can put them in all four corners or you can put a stake in opposite corners. Just understand that on rangeland, these wooden stakes actually will not last much beyond three years. And so you'll need to, if you want to do the monitoring more than a three-year timeline, you're going to need to replace these stakes. Uh, you say, well, why will they not last? Uh, it has everything to do with the fact that our native rangelands have an incredible uh, arthropod population. The uh, rangeland termite populations will completely destroy almost everything on this stake below the soil surface uh, within a three-year time period, especially when you have average or above average precipitation. Now, I did not drive these wooden stakes down to the depth that is needed. You should only have uh, probably somewhere four to six inches maximum uh, sticking above the soil surface. But remember, this is black root sod, and I would shatter these wooden stakes before I could get them in that deep. So um, here is a situation where you probably actually would be better off uh, putting a metal stake in opposite corners. Um, Make sure that in every photograph that you take that you have your plot identification sheet. Uh, and it looks like you cannot read this, but actually if you were to zoom in on this, this is fully legible. There is one thing that, that you do need to keep in mind, and that is sometimes uh, you only need to, to uh, reorient the clipboard an inch or two to eliminate all the glare that's coming off. And this is light blue. You can use... Uh, light yellow paper. Do not use white paper because you will maximize the potential for glare coming from the sun. So here's, here is the landscape photograph, literally. Uh, and uh, this is one of the three photographs that we're asking you to take. You can see the graduated staff very easily. Uh, and take this photograph, if you would, please take it in a way so that your plot area literally sets right at the bottom. Center this photograph on your tape and make sure that the full height of the graduated staff is in the photograph and always try to get a little bit of the, the, uh, the horizon in the photograph. Uh, and that just helps uh, with the relocation process. Let's move on to the rest of the steps. And uh, here we're now set up to take uh, a side or a uh, um, Let's take a look here. We're going we're gonna to go now to the top view. And uh, what doesn't, I don't really care what kind of camera you use. I'm, I'm using a, a phone here. You could use a, a pocket size uh, digital camera, uh, like a, a Canon PowerShot. Uh, maybe you even have a full frame digital camera. Whatever works for you is fine. Uh, when I'm doing this work, just as a point of uh, of, of uh, ease, making things easier. There are some small things that are frequently needed in the process of setting up and then taking repeat measurements. Uh, if you have a jacket uh, that has large cargo pockets, that makes things pretty handy. You can put everything, you can put uh, cameras, phones, GPS units, uh, compasses in these large bulky pockets. Uh, and this is just a, this is an inexpensive um, uh, fly fishing jacket with large cargo pockets that I routinely use uh, for monitoring activities. But this is the second shot that we need to have you take. And this is the, uh, the over uh, uh, view, the, the top, from the top shot. And uh, uh, you'll, don't get frustrated. Your first shot is unlikely to be perfect. But I want to point out something here, and that is get your toes up fairly close to the frame. You're going to hold that candle, the, the camera, hold the camera straight out away from you when you take the shot. And remember the angle. Hold it straight out. You should have your feet positioned fairly close to the frame. 
and this toe is actually uh, out away from that clipboard, which is laying flat. Um, get up close to the frame, hold that camera as, as near as you can over the middle of that, that frame, and then take the shot. And the, end, the thing that's really important here is that uh, after you take each shot, uh, just to take a minute and do a little bit of editing. Take a look and see, okay, is that shot, is that a keeper? Uh, I can tell you on average that I will generally, uh, I will generally delete uh, two to three frames at this point in the monitoring process. Uh, each time you take one, uh, each of the three photos, the landscape, the overhead, and the side photographs, each time you do that, take a look on the monitor and make sure that those are keeper slides. Also, please note that uh, we've got this graduated staff. We've moved it down to this point, and it's on, uh, I think the best thing is just to get it on the opposite left-hand corner of the plots Make sure that the six-inch increments are down and the one-foot increment is on the top. Okay, what should that slide look like? Uh, this is a keeper, and uh, you'll find that uh, as, you, uh, as you take these photographs, uh, that you're going to have uh, uh, some strange angles, but be patient. You can see the tip of my uh, 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 boot uh, uh, well, you'll see if you have, it, it, we don't care if your boots show up. That's the point that I want to make. Uh, that's not an issue. The important thing is to make sure that you have all of your photo information on this clipboard, and the clipboard is included in every each of the three photographs uh, that we're asking you to make. And uh, you can look down at this, and you can see, as Kat, or pardon me, as, as Julie has already demonstrated, you can see that there are different species here. That's easy to see. Uh, and let me just point some of these out. Now, this is the, the threadleaf sedge or the black root. Uh, we also have blue grandma, this lighter yellow color. And uh, there are some small clumps in the photograph. Here are a couple of clumps of six weeks fescue. You can note that there is not a lot of litter on the ground here. And yet, this is the best that we have after two uh, continuous years of drought. Uh, on this location, we were we had a 50 percent deficit by the end of the, of the plant year in 2012, and a 38 percent deficit uh, by the end of 2013. This photograph was taken just a couple of days ago, um, uh, and you can see we've got some good soil moisture to get things going. Let's take a look at what it would. Uh, this is what it would look like if you were using the mason ruler, the brick mason ruler. Um, and, and again, I would encourage you to use wooden stakes uh, to mark these corners so that you can come back very quickly and lay, uh, either lay your PVC frame down or your, your wooden ruler down in order to delineate it for the photograph. And, if, and then we can take a look at the side view. Uh, make sure that you prop your, uh, your clipboard up and uh, uh, and get that uh, uh, in, into your photo. You've always got to have this thing in the photo. Uh, I'm back just far enough so that I can get uh, uh, all of the frame, the clipboard, and the graduated staff in the picture. And this is uh, what that would look like. This is a situation where if you're using a PVC frame, that's what that looks like. Uh, if you go back to, if you're going to decide to use the brick mold rule, uh, the, the, uh, the mason, pardon me, the mason uh, rule, uh, then that's, that's what it would look like. Now remember, it'll be a lot easier to uh, set up your photo points by using the PVC frame. And once the frame is set up, you may decide to keep using it all the way through the monitoring. But if for some reason you need to minimize the size of whatever you're going to use to delineate the frame, once the wooden stakes have been driven in and left in the corners, then you can use the mason brick ruler in order to do that. And then what, what I actually prefer to do is I like to, uh, to do the compass work or the GPS work after all those photographs are done. At that point, you know, everything is fine. The three stakes are, are in the ground. And so uh, you can uh, 
you can use, I don't know how accurate the GPS units are going to be on phones, but uh, small handheld units like this Garmin unit um, are relatively inexpensive and they're accurate uh, within, a, within a meter or two. That's fairly good accuracy. They also have compasses. Uh, the nice thing about uh, the, uh, the Garmin unit or the, the handheld GPS units is that you can log information uh, for each site, label your, uh, label your, uh, your, your, your GPS data accordingly so that when you take a look at it, uh, you'll know, well, is that, is that uh, the first, second, or, or third stake? This would be the first stake. That would be the origin stake. And you have other helpful information that's readily available with a GPS unit. And then after I get that, that, that information, then the final thing that I do is I would go back and, and, uh, and go ahead and put your marker in. You could use a, uh, an old disc and hold it in place uh, with a piece of rebar. These T-bar posts come in a lot of different sizes, and if your vegetation is relatively short like this site will be, then uh, you most definitely could use a shorter T-bar post. And red is far better than hunter orange or white. It just seems to hold up better. But there's the origin stake. That's number one. There's the 50-foot stake, and here's the 100-foot stake uh, out at this point. So. Uh, th that's a, a, a quick summary of what has worked best for me. This is a method that I think will be relatively uh, fast. It should be highly repeatable, especially if you drive two or four stakes into the corners uh, of your plot area.